Andre, well, why don't I quickly hand over to you because I know we're behind schedule, but we will give you a bit of time to go past the, if it works for you to go past since we know we're a bit late starting. Um, really excited to have you here uh, to learn more about uh, your work. Um, so using an expertise to acquire uh, through 1200 member organizations with Godan uh, to learn more about the uh, examples of cost effective initiatives to improve food production practices and co contribute to climate change control, which is a big theme for us here at uh, the summit is like, how can open data help us be more effective in responding to climate change? So really excited for what you have to share with us, Andre. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, I had the opportunity to listen to Aaron's presentation, and just as a segue to it, I will just briefly mention that uh, we go down. We and I explain who go down is really. We did some work in Canada for the government of Quebec, looking at what uh, looking at food security, or as First Nations call it in Northern Quebec, food independence uh, issues. So we looked at. Um, good initiatives, uh, initiatives with the greatest impact, initiatives that use open data for this purpose across Northern Canada, as well as Northern other countries that, that we have as partners, be it Russia, Sweden, Iceland, and others. So we generated a report that uh, might give tons of good ideas to, uh, to the previous audience and, and whoever else is interested in this important topic. So if anybody wants to get a copy of the report, just let me know and I'll be very happy to share that with them. Now, uh, I'll just go straight to the presentation here. Oh, I guess I'll minimize myself because you, you've, you've seen me. So sustainable uh, nutrition security, just a uh, second word of clarification. When we say nutrition security, uh, it's uh, we say it with a purpose. Uh, until recently, we used to speak more about food security, but there's a significant difference in between the two. Food security is really to fight hunger. So it makes it, it's to provide something you can eat uh, to reduce hunger, but not necessarily something as nutritious as should be. And maybe not enough attention was put to that. So nutrition security is more than food security because it involves the uh, looking at the quality of the food that we're ingesting uh, in biological terms. So that, that's what this will be about. Now, oh. Uh, Godan is a new organization, uh, pretty young, I would say. We started in December 2014. At that time, we had a, a handful. Oops, we had a handful. Uh, I don't know why they don't appear there, but you'll, so you'll have to trust me on that one. We had about five members. We had Canada, the U.S., Kenya, uh, USDA, and DFID, the U.K. So we had five members, all united by this belief that by sharing data and its underlying knowledge. We can uh, we can be better. We can produce better. We can reach uh, more uh, more easily, so to speak, uh, nutrition independence for all. So I guess that was a good idea because in 2022 now we have more than 1,200 partner organizations, not individual organizations, which are governments, research centers, the private sector, international and national NGOs. Um, First Nation organizations in many countries, et cetera. So we're all over the world, um, which gives us uh, an opportunity to uh, tap into a ton of knowledge, a ton of data as well, and allow this data to be shared and moved around to help those that might benefit from one to learn from the other. And I'm not speaking necessarily north-south. There's also south-north and in every possible direction. Now, this one, Aaron uh, made a, a bit of an explanation on that. There are different types of data, of course, but for us, we look at it especially from the uh, the angle of openness, how open data is, because the closer, the, cl the more close it is, uh, the more difficult it is to access it. So you have, that's why you have here on, on the left what is most closed. Uh, that's generally internal data to organizations like payroll and things like that. And then gradually it's opened up, named access. It's access, but under a condition, like your driver's license. Um, Group-based access, um, access that to data that is really relevant to a specific group, like medical research data. Then public access, something that the public can tap into, sometimes with uh, limitations. So there might be a list license that gives you some restrictions as to how and what you can do with the data. And finally, there's uh, data that's open to everyone, like weather data, for example, or, or bus schedules. Now, when we think of um, food security, not even yet nutrition security, <coughs> let's say food security, we're thinking that there's more and more people. We just learned this week that we're going to have the 8 billion citizens on this planet. 
uh, having in mind that at the beginning of the century, there was about 2 billion of us on, on the planet. So there'll be within less than, well, let's say ha a little more than a half a century, less than half a century, we're going to multiply the, the world's population by four. So that's not a, a small uh, thing to do. Now, if we look at this graph, what that shows, this is the uh, the productivity or maize, uh, measured in volume of production for agriculture worldwide. Uh, in this example, I use the UK, but the same is true worldwide. So where you see that until the 1700s or 1600s, uh, we were doing, the world was doing agriculture in a very uh, uh, primitive way, so to speak. And then gradually with the introduction of mid, uh, uh, mechanical equipment, and especially through the medical, uh, sorry, the industrial revolution, productivity is shot right up. So it doesn't show so much because of the way the graph is done, but productivity in the in the field of agriculture was basically multiplied by four during that period, which is quite nice. But what, what is even nicer is that in uh, from the 1950s onward, uh, with the introduction of data uh, in at play in looking at nutrition security, uh, you can see that the productivity has increased uh, another threefold. So even more drastically and even more in absolute terms than the industrial revolution did earlier uh, in the past. So data. Now, one thing that is really not helping us when we think about food or nutrition security is we have a number of obstacles to overcome. One I just mentioned, the fact that we have four times more people on the planet that we used to do, but yet we still only have one planet and not four. So that means we need to be four times more efficient uh, just to feed the people we have right here. Um, so that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is among the obstacles we're facing is uh, climate change, especially reflected in extreme weather events, uh, which we see more and more around the world. Extreme weather events are hurricanes, droughts, floods, fires, extreme heat, which we see on CNN every day and, and most of the other media. But what is scary, you see this uh, this table reads from left to right, and then from one row, one row to the other. So, and the bluer it is, uh, the more calm the weather is. The more dark red these spots there, the more that you have, this is where the extreme weather events happened that year. That's in 1955, you had about 1% of the globe's surface that was affected by extreme weather events. And, and then as time goes by, you, you especially from the two, year 2000 onwards, you see a drastic shift where here you started to have, in 1975, you started to have uh, a fair amount of extreme weather events uh, still somewhat localized. But then from 2006, it started to be all over the world. So it's the dark red, as, I'm, as I mentioned, in 2007, 8, 9, 10. And now you see where in 2011, it's very dark red everywhere, almost everywhere. In absolute percentages in 1955, 1% of the Earth's surface was affected by extreme weather events. In 2021, the estimate is 25%. And as you can see, the pace of uh, expansion of these uh, these terrible events is accelerating. Because you see, in just 10 years, we uh, we increased by, by 10%, almost doubled in the last 10 years. So it's uh, it's very worrisome. Um, because as we know, floods and fires and so on interfere very much with uh, the capacity to produce food, especially in the regions that are affected. One thing that people don't think about, or maybe don't know about, but that's equally important if we think of nutrition security, go beyond food security and think about nutrition, is that with global warming, one thing that happens is that the quality of the food that we produce through agriculture decreases. The warmer it gets, the um, the greater the losses we have in various uh, um, nutritive elements that I would normally be in in the food, but also in in the absolute volume of food that that is being produced. Right now, we see it at the cup in the discussions they're having right now. We're hovering very near plus two degrees Celsius as it is now. While it was the the objective was one point five degrees Celsius by two thousand fifty, so we're almost there now. And some places we've exceeded it already. But just to give you an idea of the impact this has on the key food crops around the world and even in Canada. Uh, so we look at two degrees. Two degrees is the one, the, the bar with the stripes on it. So that means that with two degrees temperature, so we're just about there by 2030 for sure we'll be there. 
So that means in Africa, the Africa maize, which is one of the main crops there, uh, production is estimated to have fallen by 25%, unless we change something. If we don't, that's what's in the pipeline for this. And that's not just in Africa. U.S. maize is basically going to face the same, even worse. Uh, actually, it's near near a 30% loss compared to now. Now, the doomsday scenario, if we're to go to three degrees, which some say is not just just a hypothesis, but some feel it's it's more and more likely. Uh, just look at the impact it would have on India wheat. Uh, India, as we know, is also a big wheat producer. So it's estimated that if the world's average temperature increases by 3% instead of 1.5, uh, wheat production in India is going to fall by 45%. So that uh, is very worrisome because obviously the population is not decreasing, it is increasing. So. Uh, very significant challenge. Now, in terms of the quality, I won't bore you with all these details, but just to point, as I mentioned earlier, that with global warming, the food we're producing is less and less nutritious. Just to give you some examples, uh, wheat, um, by 2050, if the trend continues, and it's likely to be even worse, um, the zinc content in wheat is likely to fall by 9.3%, iron 5%. And for other crops, it's more or less the same. I'll just flag those that are maybe more significant. In rice production, both iron and protein content is forecasted to drop by 8%, basically. Iron in, in corn or maize by 6%. In barley, uh, protein content dropped by 14%. And others, we may not think about that, but it even affects uh, potatoes, uh, fruits, vegetables with drops in protein content up to 22%. So that means that even if we succeed producing more food, despite the global warming, the quality of the food we might produce may be less. So that means that if the population continues to eat the same as they do today, we have countries today, in fact, Namibia is an example of that, where people say that we don't have hunger anymore, but yet they still have malnutrition because of the quality that they eat. Uh, has gone down uh, quite significantly. Now, where are we in Canada uh, on this? Unfortunately, I couldn't find on, on the uh, uh, Canadian data sets a more recent version of that, but indirect indications we have uh, tell us that today the situation has not changed all that much compared to 2012, whereby in 2012, now we're talking food security, not uh, nutrition security, which tends to be worse, in fact, than this. But in 2012, in, food, in terms of food security, 5.8% of all households uh, were subjected to moderately food insecure, insecurity. And 2.6%, that's in Canada, 2.6% of the families uh, face severe food insecurity. Food insecurity being de defined as if within the last month, uh, there were times uh, where you had to cut down on food in order to afford other basic necessities. So you might say, okay, 2.6%, that's not that great, but it's it's a small percentage. Yeah, but if you look at 8.4, that's already much more significant for a developed country like ours. But what's uh, also quite alarming is that uh, it's not, it's not um, shared, the burden is not shared equally. So it varies. You have the provinces on the left, provinces or territories, and you can see that the uh, territory that's most affected is the Nunavut, where we have... 18.9% of the population that is moderately food insecure and more worrisome, 18.3% that is severely food insecure. Uh, for having done the work on um, north of the 49 parallel for Plan North, I can tell you that nutrition figures are quite similar to, to this. So what do we do? Well, we have to take action. First, to better understand where and, and where the problems are. And second, to act on them. So we went through, not very long ago, we went through a survey within all of our uh, 1,200 members across the world, and we asked them, uh, for, for those who are using data as a way to uh, stimulate agriculture and nutrition, what type of data do you find has most impact for you, your organization, your country, your region? And this is what, what they said. They said the, uh, the data that is most useful for us is geo data, that's satellite data or drone data mostly. Um, and then the second one is weather data. 
much more precise than just the weather news on TV. So it has to be uh, very localized and I'll show you why. Market and price data. And then the other ones, agriculture, agronomic data, research data, and so on, which are useful. But the three bi big ones are geo data, weather data, and market data. So that's why in the last question under Aaron earlier, when somebody said, what about sustainability? Well, sustainability necessitates a business model to be built in. Even if you work in a nonprofit like I do, Aaron does, and many others do, um, whenever you start a new initiative, you should always have a business model in mind. What after? It's nice to start when we have a subsidy from someone, but always the day, the day comes when the subsidy ends. And too many good projects have died at that point because there was no thinking of sustainability throughout the duration of the project. So anyway, geodata, weather data, market data. Well, now, where do we get all this data? Well, fortunately for us, over the last 20 years, and in particular, the cost of generating, storing, processing data has gone down quite drastically, as well as the power to do so. Uh, whether it is through direct interaction through these sensors or even through IoT, the Internet of Things, where uh, data is being collected even without having a human being uh, to intervene. So, uh, so this is basically what this represents. All kinds of data and the layers represent uh, temporal, um, um, I'm not sure what the word is. So uh, like, let's say the, the green one is the first year. A uh, yellow one could be the last year, the purple, the year before, and so on. So having a wide range of data coming in over a period of time allows you to define trends and therefore to predict the future and maybe see through past interventions how we can affect the future in the way that's desirable, looking at the past interventions that had the effect that we're looking at, looking for. Now, this is all nice and good, but we can't just turn around and say, okay, well, then we'll just make the data available and then everything will be hunky-dory. Well, not really, because, well, because not, not really. Data is, is like that, is what you see here. So just giving that to the regular farmers uh, won't do much. So what needs to happen, somebody needs to pre-digest the data for us or for the end user, the target group that, that we're looking at. Uh, so that they don't have to understand all these figures that I showed you before. They just need, they have a basic question. Here, uh, this data is part of the, the data that's available, uh, free of charge also, um, is uh, massaged by an organization that's called GeoGlam. Uh, they focus on the use of geo data for the purpose of agriculture. One of the applications they develop uh, is uh, crop forecasting. So I, to be neutral, I just chose another part of the world. I, I chose Southeast Asia. Um, so as you can see on this graph, the colors show where for the coming season, uh, the crops are likely to do very well and maybe not so well. So as you can see where the green is, is where favorable um, soils are forecasted to be. Uh, yellow ones, uh, not so much, and then the other ones, uh, less. Um, GeoGlam uses uh, satellite data, but there's tons of other data that's also important um, for all kinds of reasons, uh, especially if you want to improve the quality of your nutrition. We need to imp help you improve the quality of what you eat and maybe the choices you make into what uh, you choose to buy and bring at home. So this is an example from USDA in the United States. There's, this is one of the very many sets of, of data that they have. In this one, they had at that moment around a quarter of a million types of food that were cataloged, de described, uh, identified, and, and so on. So uh, it's very easy to find information about just about any existing food in the world. However, it's still at a, a bit of a high level. I have never met so far a single person or single organization that told me that they could use all of the data that's available, whether it is in USDA or in Canada Open Data or anywhere else. Groups are, are generally have specific interests, so they, they need some of this data, but not necessarily all of it. One common mistake that people do is they say, well, we have all this ton of fascinating data available, we'll make the whole thing available to everybody. Um, sometimes it has an adverse effect because people feel overwhelmed by all of this data and they don't use it. 
fortunately, we have some groups. This one is from Colombia, but I like them very much, so I couldn't resist putting them in there. It's called Cultivando Futuro, so Growing the Future. Uh, it's a small group of uh, agriculture, agricultures, uh, 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 farmers in, uh, in Colombia that um, initially they decided to create their own little platform. Um, initially, the, the purpose was to share parts and uh, tips between one another. And then they realized that if they pooled the, their production, then they could access markets that normally they would not have access to. For example, now Cultivando Futuro, they have grown since uh, I took that slide. They have uh, big customers like uh, Whole Foods in the United States, for example. But you know, Whole Foods, they, they don't accept, uh, they don't buy uh, 100 cartons of tomatoes. They buy 10,000. So, so you have to be of a certain level and also to meet certain qualities to, to be able to sell to them. But Cultivando Futuro has achieved that. So now they're really uh, growing in an exponential way because they managed to capture, especially market data, That's that was their big thing as to how they can uh, better promote and, and market their products. Now, I'm going to gradually come back to uh, geodata. You know, now I just uh, spoke a little bit about market data through this Cultivando Futuro example, but um, back to geodata for a minute. Uh, geodata, as I said, is through satellites, uh, high and low altitude satellites, but also drones, and to some extent, some weather stations. But mostly satellites. And what's really uh, fascinating is that over the last 10 years, I would even say over the last five years, the uh, the power of the sensors attached to these drones and satellites has increased uh, dramatically. So that means now we went from a phase in the, in the 50s and 60s where satellites were there to give photos basically of uh, what was under them. But now we, they have uh, what is very similar to a ground penetrating radar on, on some of these, these sensors do exist. So um, from the air, you can have a good idea of the quality of the biomass that you're overflying at that moment. And not just in wide areas, because that's how it, it started also, or have a rough idea in, on a very wide area, but now you can do it in a very localized way. Even in a very tiny field, you can analyze that field and know exactly how the biomass is and how it could be improved. Uh, to grow one type or another of a culture on it. Just one example of that. This is uh, uh, somebody I know. This is, uh, the, anyway, the, the two pictures, the two photos are the same area. The angle is not exactly the same, but it's the same field, basically. Where and up to 2016, uh, the biomass was basically dead. Because in the past, in, in many places, the, the trend was that if it doesn't grow, you just add more fertilizer on it. But by doing that, if you do that too much, you're gradually burning the life out of your, out, out of your soil. So eventually, you, you become prisoner of that. So for sure, nothing else will grow unless you keep on pouring tons of fertilizer with all the damage it can do on the environment as well. But through data and uh, techniques that use data, you, you could see within five years the, the difference where the biomass has been restored. So there's hope. There's hope. Now, there's one word, uh, one thing you might hear about and uh, maybe not have fully visualized that. There's one concept that's very popular nowadays. It's called a, a data cube. Uh, I could tell you that, that the data, data cube is simply a, a multidimensional ma matrix but it's not uh, easy to understand or to visualize if you're not a mathematician. So, um, but a data cube is very important because it helps put together all kinds of different data and then uh, turn it in something from which you can ex extract um, trends and maybe take action. Those who pioneered in my book, those who pioneered most um, data cubes were the Australians. They did that uh, at the beginning with their data cube, which is now much bigger. Each stripe that you see here is one pass from the satellite. And then if it goes two ways or two satellites, then you have a square. And then if you do it over time, then, then you have a pile of layers, which look like cubes. So hence the expression data cube. In Australia, they did that because they had, and they still have problems uh, with floods at times and fires at other times. So they they tried to develop tools that would help them forecast where floods are likely to happen or where fires are more likely to happen and therefore take action before the catastrophe kicks in. 
I like that one here also because Australia is a very big country and so is Canada. So that's why I'm one of the happy fans of geodata as uh, one of the tools for the future. Now you can do many things with uh, with uh, geodata. You can uh, do some interesting soil analysis, but you can also tackle it for specific purposes. This is in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. As you might recall, some of you, uh, just a few years ago, Cape Town went was two days away from uh, running out of water. And it's, uh, it's one of the largest uh, cities in that part of Africa. Millions of people live there and depend on water. So the, the project we were involved then with the, our friends, the Dutch and other people, the goal was to reduce water consumption by 25% over three years. Well, we achieved that over one and a half years, twice as fast and better than that. Not only were we reduced by 30%, but we expanded the irrigated areas by 25%. So I'll let you calculate how that, that comes up too, but that's a whole lot more water suddenly made available while they were running shortages before. So when you do this type of precision agri uh, agriculture or precision irrigation in this example, you not only uh, do better things for the environment, you manage it in a more sustainable way, but you reduce your costs also quite a bit and your losses. Now, still with uh, satellite data, before, as I said, you had to have a very big surface and uh, you didn't have so much accuracy. Now you can have very fine accuracy. This is Ukraine. So you can have very fine accuracy where you can have each district or each field, even if these are different crops, because now we can train satellites, so to speak, to identify not just if there's vegetation or not, but also what kind of crop is there. And as days go by, uh, what is the trend? And, and therefore make a forecast on production in a, in a way that was impossible if only 10 years ago. Uh, this is another one that could be maybe interesting for Canada. This is also geodata in this case to track uh, wildlife, uh, especially for groups that are somewhat reliant on uh, on game for their uh, their mode of living, but uh, for anyway. So tracking wildlife is, is also quite important, whether it is for hunting or if it is for protecting the wildlife. So as you can see, this is it. So you can see at uh, any point in time where the wildlife is, where it's going and where it's likely to be in a certain period of time. Now, uh, in Godan, I, if I like my job. I think uh, we're very fortunate because we deal with a broad range of people. Uh, our partners cover anything from genomes to satellites, so it's quite diverse. And sometimes we come up with combinations that uh, were not thought of before, um, but that can produce very significant advantages. For instance, uh, in five countries so far, uh, we have helped uh, initiate projects where cell phone towers are used as weather towers just through a simple uh, uh, software program that was added and developed by our Dutch and German researchers. Uh, the concept is that when it rains, the efficiency, you see these cell phone towers, what they do is they're repeaters. Huh? They, they repeat a signal and they retransmit to the next one and the next one. But when it rains, uh, the efficiency of these towers decreases because it's harder for the signal to go through the rain, especially if it rains a lot. So they figured out that if, uh, uh, if we could translate the, the efficiency variations in millimeters of rain, then instantly these cell phone towers could be, uh, could be weather stations. Not to, to be honest, not as precise as a real weather stations, but these ones come for free because they're already there. So in a big country like ours, maybe there's something there that could be useful for us. Now, uh, data and useful data is not necessarily behind a fancy computer or fancy equipment. It can be right in your hand. So I just uh, took these two that I like very much. They're from Bayer. Uh, using image recognition, you can uh, use it for many things, uh, whether it is to uh, identify as on the left, uh, invasive species of plants, uh, we can use it for diseases also on plants or as on the right, uh, infestation of insects. So just by taking a photo of the insect in, in a fraction of a second, it comes back to you, tells you what it is, what it does, and how to get rid of it. So that's big data right in your hand. The same is true in other areas. This is for farmers. This is examples of uh, uh, open data that's available for farmers when they go fishing. We have, by the way, if you are like YouTube, I encourage you to go and check open oceans. 
Uh, that's uh, the name of one of the uh, the clips we did, um, something similar to that. And that one at that time, that's about three years ago, it won at that time the uh, the best uh, short documentary on uh, uh, on oceans. So anyway, so these are some examples: the wind, the temperature of the water, the wind direction, the waves, the the depth, uh, and so on. So therefore, helping greatly uh, improve the efficiency of the the, the fishing operation. Now, there's an indirect way to benefit from uh, from open data. Um, here is vertical agriculture. I'm sure you've all heard of it now. It's uh, They used to call it uh, agriculture in, in the container because that's how it started. Um, the advantage with this is that you grow things in a totally controlled environment where there are no insects. You can uh, control how much fertilizer you give, how much water. Uh, if you go to Japan, and you order a salad in a restaurant, you have eight chances out of 10 that uh, your salad has been grown in a, in a container like this. They do up to 10 crops per year of these salads in, in the containers. Well, they did that because they were running out of space because Japan is, uh, is, is, is a pretty busy country. Um, these containers are now used in many parts of the world because you can just insulate them and have them even if it's uh, 50 degrees outside or minus 40. You can still grow your stuff in rows, so in a very dense way, and for a cost that uh, that can be uh, pretty small if you do things smartly. And then we can uh, Canada, I think, would be in a good position not just to use it, especially in the northern part where agriculture is limited by the weather, uh, but also as a producer of equipment, whereby we see that by 2021 it is estimated that vertical agriculture will be a 30 billion Canadian dollars market at least personally i wouldn't be surprised if it was more so that's another opportunity for us now uh when i started uh, this uh, discussion with you i uh, i tried to say by my talking about food security versus nutrition security i tried to emphasize the differences between the two whereby to solve the the nutrition challenges the world has ahead we have of course to produce more but we also have to produce better in the sense that we have to find ways to make the food we produce uh, at least as nutritious as it used to be, and if possible, more nutritious. And a lot of work is being done on that, whether it is in developing new species of uh, products or in storing them differently or in growing them maybe in other places. Well, uh, and finally, reducing waste. That's the purpose of this slide here. Uh, we are here in the first column. So this is the number of calories per person that is wasted in food that is uh, being thrown away, basically. So as you can see, the, the worst offender is North America. So that's that's us, basically. In North America, we throw away every day the equivalent of 1,500 calories per person. So that means that only with what we throw away, we would have almost enough uh, to feed ourselves. So um, as you can see, it's a major waste. And, and it's terrible in many ways, of course. It's terrible because there are other people on this planet that sh that would be very happy to eat that food that we're throwing away. But also, it would help us uh, reduce costs. Uh, you know, if if we if we waste uh, two thirds of what we produce, that means that uh, two thirds of the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that agriculture generated, could have been uh, eliminated if it wasn't that. Now, I'm not naive. I'm not saying that we're going to eliminate. Uh, uh, food waste by 100%, but uh, still, if we can reduce that, then there'll be less agriculture emissions. And then uh, there'll be a second bonus is that if we don't throw that food away, because food that we throw away rots and also generates uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that's something we must have in mind and uh, programs designed not just to increase agricultural productivity, but also uh, improve, so to speak, consumer behavior uh, would be very important. What, one last uh, element. Um, talking about hunger in particular, uh, most organizations that I work with focus especially on child malnutrition or child undernutrition in this case here. Uh, and that's the one on which there, there are some good news. Huh? Child uh, undernutrition are the, the yellow bars that you see here. So whether it is moderate, whoops, whether it's moderate or whether it is severe as the dark red is. What this shows is that in, in between 1990 and 2015, uh, child undernutrition 
has decreased by half worldwide, <coughs> more, more than half. So, so that's the good news. And of course, uh, the adults, uh, men, adults under nutrition also went down in the same way. But what is less good is that if you look again between 1990 here, where you had these ones that were undernourished, and you had these ones that were o that were overnourished, especially the green ones. I'm sorry for that. Especially the green ones, which shows um, overweight, which leads to um, uh, diabetes type two and other diseases linked to uh, to food, basically. Uh, the interesting thing is that during this period over there, there are only two countries in the world, only two, that managed to virtually eliminate undernutrition uh, while not replacing it with over overnutrition or malnutrition, really, uh, as we can see here. So there are only two that achieved that. That's Korea and Japan, so these two. So maybe we have to learn a little bit from them. So data-driven nutrition security, we need to do three things. We need to find ways to produce more food. We need ways to produce better food that keeps its nutrients so that has more nutrients. Um, and finally, we need to do less waste. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Amazing, Andre. Thank you so much. I mean, that was, that was fantastic. Um, a lot to chew on. Uh, so on behalf of everyone in here in the room, but also the lots of people we have listening online as well. Um, thank you so much, Andre, for uh, what you had there. I know we are still over time, so I'm thinking, is there any burning question? If there isn't, I think we might finish here so we can jump into the next session, because I know Wilfried has been incredibly patient with us as well. Um, uh, so Andre, thank you so much for taking time. The presentation was fantastic. And I've got lots to think about now to chew on, uh, so thank you. Uh, and yeah, so next. It was a real pleasure. And if somebody wants a copy, I'll be happy to leave it with you. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely.